Hi, friends. I'm so excited to share this episode with you. Our conversation is with Judith Schwartz. Uh, this is about her new book, Reindeer Chronicles, which is an amazing, really important read about uh, regeneration projects at scale worldwide, including locations like China, Saudi Arabia, Norway, even New Mexico. And uh, just so excited to share this with you. And I I uh, hope you'll get the book Reindeer Chronicles and wanted to let you know we've got a partnership with Chelsea Green, one of the leading sustainability publishers, so that if you use the code YOE10, that's YOE10, you'll get a 10% discount on Judith's book Reindeer Chronicles and any other of the Chelsea Green books you might want to get for your library. So I hope you enjoy. Take care. Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Perry, and today we're visiting with author Judith Schwartz. Hey, Judith. Hey. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. Good to be here. Great. Well, I'm so excited that we get to talk with you again. You've actually uh, been on our podcast once before uh, talking about another one of your wonderful books. Um, I think Cows Save the Planet was our focus then, and we also talked some about Water in Plain Sight, uh, another one of your books. But today we're speaking about your latest, The Reindeer Chronicles. And I'm so excited to have this opportunity to visit with you and share a number of these amazing uh, ecological restoration projects that you're documenting all around the planet. Thank you. Judith Schwartz is an author who tells stories to illuminate scientific concepts and nature-based solutions. A widely published journalist, she is the author of Cows Save the Planet and Water in Plain Sight. Her latest book, The Reindeer Chronicles, is a global tour of ecological restoration. Judith lives on the side of a mountain in southwestern Vermont. And so, uh, yeah, it's it, Judy, it's so great connecting with you again and um, has been such a pleasure for me reading this book of yours over the last few weeks. And I'll just show uh, the camera, the cover, so that folks who are looking at video can see this beautiful thing. And what's interesting is the title, The Reindeer Chronicles, doesn't necessarily immediately convey the scope, the breadth of what you're covering in terms of both geographic context and cultural context. And so um, I was hoping maybe for our audience, you might summarize what's in this thing and also what compelled you to pull this uh, sweeping project together. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, so the book is really a global tour of earth repair. And what, so I, look at all different efforts on a variety of scales and different geographical ecosystems and also social ecosystems. So in this book, I was more drawn than previously to the human challenges of how do we do this? How do we do what we know needs to be done, which is restoring the function of the, our, the world's landscapes and seascapes? So, um, yeah, and how did it come up? How did this come to be? Well, okay, now you're, you're talking about the inner life of a writer. So I spent many years, I guess about three, two and a half, three years, avoiding writing another book because, you know, they're kind of hard. And once you start it, you're in it. And, you know, <laughs> there's only one way through. Um, and then I realized that. I really did want to bring bring up the importance of whole landscapes. You know, so many so often when we're when we're looking at in ecological questions, we look at a piece of something. But I just felt that well certainly in terms of climate change, we have neglected the role of functioning ecosystems in climate regulation and I just felt I just felt that wanted to be a part of our discussion, that that gives us so many opportunities 
to really make positive change. Whereas if we're just looking at the pieces and we're, you know, we find ourselves up against political forces and economic forces and all of that, but just let's get the whole, the whole landscape. And the other motivating factor is that I had been collecting stories of ways that people are making tremendous, tremendous positive changes. And there's really no way that there was no kind of channel, you know, there, those stories were circulating among people in various communities in the permaculture community or in the holistic management community, but they weren't getting out. So that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, uh, I'm going to say this is a must read. I would, I would argue for many of our friends and colleagues working in the regenerative arenas and uh, working on some of these seemingly intractable challenges that we're facing. And I say it's a must read, not only because it's so filled with hope and examples, real world examples with real people uh, having real successes despite extraordinary challenges, but you also in your sort of subtle and understated, perhaps New England uh, way of writing, um, are, are challenging a handful of mainstream assumptions and ways of thinking about ourselves and our world uh, that I think is, is really important uh, for us. And that includes things like media and journalism. And I pulled out a few quotes I want to get to a little later. Uh, but before doing that, the, the other thing that really struck me, you've already mentioned the word permaculture, is that uh, it's like this is a book that documents how permaculture has really gone mainstream in our world, thank goodness. And I know as I was studying permaculture and taking the permaculture design course about 20 years ago, there was a sense that, oh, this is a really powerful but fringe thing that's happening and golly it would be amazing if this were to become very mainstream and here we are it looks like that's exactly what's happening and I was um, I was struck to see that you had written so much about permaculture in here and I'm wondering uh, in your journey as a writer how has it been for you to come into something like permaculture and to be able to talk about it in such a sweeping way across so many different contexts Wow. Well, I'm smiling as you say this, as, you, as you're saying this, because I actually am now in the middle of a permaculture design course. I mean, I could reach over and, you know, show my engineer's ruler and, you know, and my tape measure and all that. And um, so I'll give a little shout out. The course is with Sewing Solutions in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. And um, Kay is doing a K. I don't know if I can pronounce her last name, um, is Kay Cafaso, I think that's it. She is doing a great job in managing the, to balance the in-person instruction and then a lot on Zoom. You know, normally it would be three intense weekends, but, you know, we just go for one day and then we have a lot to follow up on. Yeah, so it, so, you know, it, it permaculture um, was in, intriguing to me for what it can accomplish. So I guess we can define permaculture. It's kind of a design system to support human and natural um, health, stability, and resilience. I mean, I know there are a zillion different permaculture definitions, um, but yeah, the focus is on design and holistic thinking and a series of principles such as in a system, there should be no waste in nature, because in nature, there is no waste. I mean, there are many, many principles, but that's the one that just popped into my head. So, um, yeah, I was intrigued by, well, the kind of can-do approach, you know, the can-do attitude, like, this is a challenge. Okay, we can design our way through this. So that, that intrigued me. But also, a lot of the attitudinal stuff, the, um, the notion of focusing on abundance rather than scarcity, which is actually quite radical in this culture, where everything is driven by scarcity. Our economic system is designed around scarcity. You know, even as I say the word scarcity, I could even feel like, you know, my heart beating faster. You know, our, all, our, 
you know, economy, our political economy, everything is right at our media economy right now is kind of designed around adrenaline. Um, yeah, and permaculture kind of eases that. <laughs> yeah, there's a classic uh, image in one of the older videos of, I think it's Bill Mollison who, uh, as I understand it, coined the term permaculture and really um, got it popularized with especially his main uh, tome, uh, the Permaculture Design Handbook. And uh, I think I recall seeing a video of him relaxing in his mature food forest. And there's a sense that uh, permaculture designers and uh, implementers certainly put a lot of work into these systems initially. But the idea is to work with the intelligence and the patterns of nature so that they ultimately take over and do what they're really good at doing, um, which is building soil and growing plants and uh, holding water in the ecosystem and so on, which you speak about in the book. And that we as the designers ultimately get to kick back a little and enjoy that over time. And so I, I was struck too in, in the book, The Reindeer Chronicles, how you hit on the psychology and the cultural aspects and even the neurobiochemistry of not only um, some of the opportunities and solutions, but also some of what we're up against. And you, and you mentioned adrenaline, right? And in one of the chapters, you talk about the adrenalizing that uh, I think it was Jeff Goebel who, who you uh, speak with in that uh, chapter about the conflict and con consensus in New Mexico, about how so much in our market economy is, is based on triggering the adrenaline response and that so much of what we experience in conflict and uh, the things that are causing us anxiety and so on are often coupled with that exact neurobiochemical response. And so I'm just curious, in your adventures and travels putting this book together, were you noticing times and places when your own neurobiochemistry chemistry was kind of dropping in and calming down and the adrenaline levels were dropping? Yeah, um, gosh, that's that's hard to say. I think I think I've become so aware of of that kind of equation that I do I do resist that. And it's interesting you're saying this. Okay, so I've been a journalist for many, many decades. And I think I've understood this for a really, really long time. I remember when I used to write about women's health, I used to write for a women's magazine. And for some reason I connected with someone and I used to um, give a lecture on women communications and women's health for a, a, a nursing program. And I explained that there is a kind of a, a rhythm to women's magazine articles, okay? Mm -hmm. That the point is to raise your anxiety so that you, the writer, through talking to the experts, can then lower the anxiety. I think there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of this going on. I've been, I'm very, I'm very aware of headlines and it, in the media and how, just how that triggers anxiety. And, you know, I'm saying this after having been through this experience in New Mexico with Jeff Goebel through... I spent a weekend with a community in absolute crisis where people were lit, they were fighting over access to the pump house. It's a rural community, a ranching community, and people were shooting at each other and there was sabotage and people were afraid to bring their children up to the, to the land that they had always enjoyed because they were afraid of danger. Anyway, it was a big, big, big mess. And the Bureau of Land Management, which managed that land, finally invited Jeff Goebel to, to, as a last ditch effort. And so we had this weekend workshop where we were looking at, I guess we were kind of playing with that anxiety, looking at fears, looking at hopes, looking at what is possible. And what happens is that because of our fears, we often don't see what's possible because all of our energy is used up to kind of tamp down those fears and understanding the extent to which those when those fears are kind of driving us and the you know we're in that adrenaline mode of reacting to fear all the time then 
that reifies what we're afraid of. So, you know, we kind of focus on worst possible outcomes and then wonder why we get them as opposed to taking, let's look at what the best possible outcomes might be, how might we get there and working with that. And um, in that weekend, the outcome was far better than what people even envisioned for their best possible outcomes. It was, it was so neat in that chapter to <laughs> sort of <clears throat> follow along with you and your experience. And the chapter is called Beyond the Impossible. And, and to see how Jeff walks uh, this community through some simple questions and ultimately gets them to bump up against uh, what they think might be impossible to achieve. And then he sort of flips that on his head, right? And says, well, let's assume that it's impossible, but if we were to achieve it, what steps would we take to get there? And so suddenly it has this miraculous way, it seems, of really de-escalating the fear response and up-leveling the creative and, and solution-oriented and relationship uh, opening responses that that community experienced. Yeah, it's amazing to see. It's just breaking that barrier, taking the pressure off. It's interesting about taking the pressure off because I can now just do another reference for another another discipline, the holistic management community, using um, looking at livestock as a vehicle for large large scale land restoration. That a lot of it is about when you're setting the the grazing plan, assuming you're wrong. And then that takes the pressure off. Because if you assume you're wrong, then you give it a try and, oh, that didn't work, that's fine. Or, oh, it did work. That's great, we'll go carry on that path. So yeah, it is interesting how we can work with our own tendencies to bring out the better outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was struck that in your introduction that you, you say that uh, fear can be self-fulfilling. And, you know, here we are, it's 2020, uh, obviously an extraordinary year for a variety of reasons, um, not least of which is, you know, setting aside this global pandemic, the, the fires and the erratic uh, weather conditions that we've been seeing. And uh, you and I were speaking before we, we started recording about this, and I wonder to what extent each of us might be able to sort of de-adrenalize and de-fear uh, our day-to-day -day experiences, notwithstanding some of these tremendous uh, you know, challenges and disruptions that we're facing. And I'm, I'm wondering, after writing and publishing this, is it, are some of the insights that you share in the book uh, popping up for you in your in your day to day in your um, quote unquote regular life up there in Vermont. Absolutely, I have learned so much from everyone I spent time with. And as you were saying this, and you were talking about how people are in a fear response, and I think that's just you know really suffusing the air we breathe all the time right now. The word that came into my head isn't what I would have expected, but the word is curiosity. Hmm. And you can't be curious when you're, you know, adrenalized. But I think that curiosity is something that would be such a gift. We can give that gift to ourselves because about the fires, for example, you know, I mean, obviously when you're in the, you know, when we're in the middle of them, there's nothing we can do except try to, you know, get out of the situation. But in terms of planning, and this requires a lot of planning, better planning than we collectively have done, but to be curious, what is the role of fire in our ecosystems? What, like, so as an example, what, um, you know, what does fire do? Fire is a way of breaking down plant material. You know, then you could say, well, what else breaks down plant material? Well, fungi and animals, animals that eat the brush. So you can kind of, okay, how might we create the conditions that this plant matter is broken down by fungi or by 
animals biologically as opposed to biochemically through fire. Uh, and curiosity about how has the landscape been in the past? Because as I'm reading about this now, in throughout California, much more land burned every year than is even burning in a devastating year like this year. So kind of, yeah, curiosity, I think, is really powerful and to, to really to, to ask some of these questions. So potent. It reminds me of um, this, this notion of forensic ecology. I'm, I'm glancing through my notes to try to find which uh, chapter that was in. And um, let me see here. I think that's the first chapter with um yep sure is yeah with john um, john Liu, is that how you pronounce his yep, name john Liu. yep yeah the, the indiana jones of landscape restoration he's called so yeah this chapter the great work of our time is uh subtitled lessons from the los plateau um and correct me if i'm not pronouncing that correctly but um yeah what a what a fabulous story and so uh hopeful how he and that community were able to absolutely transform that landscape. Yeah, and that that's a story that I've known now for several years and have been completely stunned that that had never become kind of a, you know, contemporary fable for, you know, a story for everyone to know about in which an area of land the size of Belgium was returned to ecological function and a couple of million people taken out of poverty. Um, yeah, so, so he talks about ecological forensics to understand in the past what had gone wrong, what actions upon the landscape had people taken that led to long-term decline in ecological function, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, he's quite the guy. And he has he has so many pithy uh, nuggets of wisdom, right? And and you you say how he in there uh, says we have a choice uh, in terms of how we're impacting these landscapes, and um, it's 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 just tremendous that not only is he a practitioner of ecological regeneration on the ground, so to speak. But I mean, he's a, he's a philosopher really uh, for our times. And um, boy, I, my hope is that through your work, your book, what we're doing with the Wine Earth community, we can help many more people become aware of what has happened on the Los Plateau because it truly is an amazing story. Yeah. And I, I started with that story because I wanted to just put right up front this is the scale at which this can be done. Now, of course, this was China, where it was a top-down effort, and villagers were paid to be part of this, but, but it, it happened, and that, and that in itself is really meaningful. And then, of course, I go to very small-scale efforts that can be very deeply meaningful in other ways. Yeah, I love, I love how... Mr. Liu says that, you know, once we have the knowledge that we can restore these landscapes, then the responsibility follows that we shall restore these landscapes. And um, that, that really struck me as a, one of the most potent expressions in, in the book and in what you're documenting. Yeah, and he really comes down, for him it comes down to intention. If our intention is to restore the earth, we will restore the earth. Yeah. If our intention is to create more shiny objects to be sold at profit, well, then that's what we will do. Mm. Well, it seems, too, that in, in many respects, the choice that we have at this stage in our species story on this planet is is one between uh, being the desert making species or the desert healing species. And in the uh, second chapter, Life Begets Life, uh, Replenishing Middle Eastern Deserts, you talk about this amazing al Baida project um, in Saudi Arabia, south of Mecca, with Neil Spackman and others. 
And I love in how you dropped in there that uh, desertification, the, the, disruption of ecosystems into dry, brittle landscapes is wicked easy, right? That, that's such a <laughs> Northeast way of putting it, I think. And, uh, but, but you mentioned how um, a uh, scholar, uh, Elizabeth Sotoris, says that biologically we humans are a desert-making species. And there's plenty of evidence for that, especially in the Middle East, North Africa region. Uh, however, with what is being documented here and, and with efforts of thousands and millions of people around the world, we are also uh, reversing and greening deserts. So it's as if we're facing this, this massive challenge and choice as a species. And uh, we're, we're uh, poised at uh, a, a great uh, fork in the road, if you will. And I'm just, I'm curious um, with all that you've seen and understood here, what do you think is necessary for us to choose the path of greening and restoration at scale um, across many, many more uh, geographic regions and communities and many more millions of people? Yeah, well, one huge thing is for people to know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And because these stories really haven't been circulating to a wider public, we don't really know it's possible. We're kind of trained to think that you know, the environment is static unless it goes wrong. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And I think that's, you know, a function of our, our disconnection to the land. But what will it take? You know, I was thinking about this earlier, you know, and just thinking, you know, just, you know, knowing that I have friends that are evacuating their homes and, or they've got their suitcases ready in Oregon and California. And, you know, just this is not, this doesn't feel good collectively. You know, I guess just like a little tiny bit, like when will we realize that it feel, rather than holding on to a notion of some kind of system and stability that we believed we had, but maybe we never really had, and just, you know, rather than really trying to hold on to it, just acknowledging that we can, we can move forward to heal our environment and ourselves, just how much better that would feel. Just all the tension around trying to cling to some notion of, you know, globally, or, you know, we talk about America, you know, like we hold on to what is the story of this country and we're holding on to it like our, you know, getting this image like our knuckles are getting whiter and whiter as we're, as we're grasping that. I, I don't know, but just to accept the unknown, just to ex ex embrace that there is this other possibility, I just feel like that will unleash tremendous creativity and energy. But when that will happen, I don't know. I think in, in, in many ways it's already happening, right? Which is you're documenting it. We know other folks who aren't in your book who are doing this kind oh, of work. Yeah. Right. And it is happening. And it a lot is of happening. people are doing the work. They're so busy doing it that they're not talking about it. And that's why, you know, I'm useful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly right. It's um, uh, not only you, you and what you write about and uh, how you write about what you write about. But I think also, you know, these efforts we're doing, for example, through the Why on Earth community, and I was mentioning to you that I recently moved to uh, Elk Run Farm, where we're uh, doing some beautiful collaboration with uh, their um, uh, drylands agroecology research organization, and beautiful permaculture, a wonderful setting. And uh, even this morning, I was waking up, because we had this strange early September snow thinking gosh you know should I be out there uh, helping with whatever plants need to be tended to because of the heavy snow or is this work of sharing your story with lots of other folks who may not otherwise hear about it another way to be in service and I think it's it's really a both and we we have more and more people on the ground uh, in in the soil working with the specific 
uh, physical uh, aspects of ecological restoration and regeneration and uh, very important is also the storytelling of what's happening, the successes, the wins, etc. cetera. And uh, it's, I think, a lot of fun to be able to do a little bit of both. And I know you, you also live on a uh, farm property in Vermont that allows you, I imagine, to get out and connect with the soil some yourself. And uh, I, I got to ask as a writer, um, when you're writing, and I, I know that that can mean many, many, many hours in front of the computer and so on, what uh, is connecting with the land and the soil um, for you as, as part of your process as a writer? Wow, well, a lot of my writing takes place in non-gardening months mm -hmm. when I'm more likely to take a chapter in my head up to the, another mountain where I'd cross-country ski. But, oh, absolutely, it's just... I don't know. I don't have the language for it. Um, yeah, just to be, just to be in the soil, to be, to watch the plant, the plants grow, the seedlings, the stages. Thinking this, to, the we're never going to see any real tomatoes coming from this plant. It's taking forever, and then you blink, and they're there. And uh, we've expanded our growing area this year, so with more perennials asparagus and berries berries very much like this land you know i find that out the hard way every time i take a step and you know i'm in a blackberry bush and with thorns but so growing a lot of berries and flowers and more pollinators so you know it's just it's just joy so it i'm so lucky i get to have that balance of of the writing and, and the doing. And, and it's a contemplative kind of doing, which is a very special thing that we often in our culture don't get the chance to do because everything's fast and, you know, and electronic and everything, but it's wonderful. And um, for an experiment, I had sheep on our land and hopefully we can do that again. And that was wonderful, although I didn't end up including that in this book. But just, you know, these other life forms with personalities and tend tendencies and silliness and incredible appetite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Um it's beautiful to be able to experience that balance. And one of the, one of the things that has struck me with uh, what has occurred in the last six months with COVID is that friends and colleagues who weren't otherwise all that engaged in things like sustainability or stewardship or regeneration are gardening more. And it seems one of the hidden secrets, if you will, to having that direct uh, opportunity of engagement is that it absolutely enhances our quality of life in this beautiful, subtle, simple way. And thinking back to conversations I had with my grandparents and thinking back in time uh, through some of the history of this country and other places all around the world, it seems that as humans, we are wired to have that direct relationship with the soil, literally, physically and with the plants, and that it's only quite recently that many of us have gotten away from that and almost forgotten in a strange amnesia how important that is. And I wonder too, how a book like yours might help many thousands and millions of more people create that direct relationship themselves in their own lives, whether it's in a big city or some suburban yard, because uh, that's an opportunity right at our fingertips that truly, as that scales, can help also tip the balance toward the healing of the planet. Right. And then I think about children who um, are many of whom are growing up with less nature than someone of my generation might have had, um, yeah. you know, in more crowded cities. But just the notion that the understanding that nature is everywhere. I have a friend who teaches permaculture to children in New York City, and she talks about how even the little plot where the soil surrounding a, an urban tree, you can mulch that and you can create biodiversity and life there. And the children who watch this process find joy and excitement and mastery in that too. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's lovely to see uh, more community gardens popping up in New York City, um, as is happening in many of the urban centers all around the world. And uh, especially lovely to see that more and more educators are incorporating things like school gardens into the curricula so that thousands and millions of students have opportunities for those direct uh, points of contact. So you're, you're speaking a bit about your own experience and I was really struck in this uh, chapter called Busting the Myth, Why Women Belong in the Saddle. And um, you, you share something that was, I, I thought a, a bit vulnerable as, as a writer, at least revealing when you, when you say that um, you can't, you say as the writer, I can't tell you how many women I meet who say they have always felt an elemental connection to soil and how it grounds them. And in a couple of the sentences uh, previous, you share that you sort of came to this through your, your research and your writing, but that you've encountered a lot of women who have this uh, elemental connection and, and grounding connection. And I'm wondering if you might unpack that a little for us and expand on that. What, what does that mean? And how has that been articulated by some of these women that you've had these conversations with? Yeah. So just a lot of people talk about um, it, it evokes memories of childhood and maybe visiting, a, maybe there was a relative, a grandparent that had a farm that they always visited every summer and that loomed very large in their sense of identity and only connect with that when their hands are in the soil. I think a, a real groundedness, a connectedness to, to the earth. Um, one woman I interviewed had a really serious illness and truly believes that it was that she really made a step in the right direction toward health when she began to volunteer at a farm and could feel the soil in, 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 in her hands. And, you know, I guess what was revealing personally is that, you know, that kind of I'm more of a in my head kind of person. And so I kind of went from, oh, soil, all that stuff in my head. And then then I got there as opposed to having always had that connection. So, you know, we all get, we all get places. It's just a different route for many of us. So instead of saying uh, all, all roads lead to Rome, we can say all roads lead to humus or something like that, huh? Yes, we could. <laughs> so, you know, I got to say that I, I'm not sure I have yet expressed how powerful I think your book is in sharing with us as an audience so many examples of successful ecological restoration in our world that have already occurred. And you're covering all kinds of places from Saudi Arabia to New Mexico to um, the northern uh, parts of Norway to Hawaii, uh, etc. And my gosh, I just, I want to, my heart is, is singing. I want to, I want to make sure everybody knows about this and take some time to actually read uh, what you've written. And maybe I'll use that as an opportunity just to drop your website, which is judithdschwartz.com um, so that folks can find your book and find out more about you and what you've been writing about. Um, and of course, you're also on Facebook at uh, judith.d.schwartz and um, on Twitter, Judith D. Schwartz without any punctuation. And we'll put all this in the show notes. But um, yeah, this is, this is one of those books um, where it's so packed full of really practical knowledge. Um, there's a lot of actual how-to in here. Then there's also the human and psychological and cultural, which is really, really important. And it's all in this one book. And so, you know, Judy, I'm just like thinking to myself, how, how do we, what else can we do to help get the word out about this? Because this is really important. Well, I'm wondering what ideas you might have. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be thinking about it. And yeah, just I, 
guests keep the conversation. I mean, there, we have so many distractions right now. You know, as we mentioned earlier, so much anxiety that kind of adrenalizes us and pulls us. But we are connected to this earth. This, you know, what happens to our landscapes where we are and the landscapes that we are connected to and we're all connected. If, 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 this, if COVID has told, uh, taught us nothing else, it's that we are all connected and there is no elsewhere. So yeah, to make sure, yeah, so that we have a way to get the focus onto the health of our landscapes. Absolutely. Well, let me just take a quick moment to give a few shout outs to uh, some of our social ecosystem and, and some of the organizations who are helping to make this podcast series uh, a reality. And just a reminder, uh, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. And I'm your host, Aaron Perry. And today we're visiting with Judith Schwartz, the author of The Reindeer Chronicles. We will get to reindeers before we uh, conclude the episode, by the way. And uh, just want to give a big shout out to several organizations who support all of this work. Uh, that includes Earth Coast Productions, the Lidge Family Foundation, Alpine Botanicals, Purium, Vera Herbals, Growing Spaces, Soil Works, Earth Water Press, Earth Hero, 1% for the Planet, Dr. Bronner's, and Waylay Waters. If you go to whyonearth.org and go to the Sponsors and Supporters page, you'll find all of these organizations listed. And for, with many of them, you can either click through or use the code whyonearth uh, to get discounts on their products and services. So it's a great win-win regenerative economy example there. And of course, uh, a special thanks to everybody who has joined our uh, monthly giving program and our monthly member program. And we have folks uh, giving each month at every level you might uh, think of. And at certain levels, you can get shipments uh, to your home of the Waylay Waters uh, hemp-infused aromatherapy soaking salts. And so for those of you who enjoy that kind of self-care, that's a wonderful win-win uh, as well. And um, so, you know, speaking of soaking salts, and I know a lot of folks who tend to do their hot bathing in the cold months. Uh, you were way up in uh, the northern parts of uh, Norway and uh, visiting with all kinds of activists and folks doing good uh, regenerative and holistic management work up that way. But also uh, you came across a really compelling story of, of some of what was happening with the indigenous folks uh, way up in those northern reaches and was hoping you might uh, tell us a bit about that and and maybe you might even share how you ended up choosing the reindeer chronicles as the title of the book yeah so i found myself in norway in trondheim um, at a symposium on indigenous knowledge indigenous yeah indigenous knowledge and it was to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Norwegian government at the time and the Sami people, there, there was a treaty signed. So while I was there, there was a case going on that had really captured the public imagination. The government had insisted that there were too many reindeer up in Finnmark, the Northern province and that's where the Sami live. And so they were mandating that reindeer herders cull their herds of, down to a certain percentage. There was a young reindeer herder, 23 years old, who said, no, I am not going to cull my herd. If I do that, I won't be able, to, I'm you know, just starting out, I'm, I'm you know, on, working on a very thin margin right now, I won't be able to continue. And it's not only about me, because I'm a young herder, and if my peers, if other young herders aren't able to continue this tradition, then the tradition will die. So he won a couple of cases, you know, a couple of rounds, 
And then the government kept challenging. And at the end of 2017, the government prevailed. Now what happened, because I've been in touch with his sister, who is an internationally known conceptual artist, whose work documented this, this, this whole um, narrative. Um, no, she does very, very striking work. Her name is Marit Ansara, and the herder is Jovset Antesara. And so apparently, rather than kill the reindeer, he, well, he has appealed to the UN um, human rights and indigenous rights entity, but there has been no development there. But rather than kill the, the reindeer, they gave the reindeer to family members. So, you know, the reindeer are still there, but he doesn't get to manage them now. And so that's really tragic. And what's really important to note, a couple of things. One is that this, the Norwegian government wants that land. They want it for hydro, they want it for mining, they want it for access to the coast and coastal waters where there may be energy implications and opportunities. And that their claim that the reindeer there are too many reindeer and the reindeer were harming this fragile ecosystem. That was based on a clear misunderstanding of the science of how these animals interact with the landscape. Because in fact, as the Sami manage the reindeer, it actually maintains the permafrost and the, the tundra kind of the grass, the tundra grassland ecosystem, because the in the summer the the reindeer are nibbling the they're browsing, so they're keeping the brush down, and the brush has darker leaves which absorb heat, whereas the the heath has a higher reflectivity or or albedo it reflects the heat, and in the winter time they are pressing down the snow, which means that that the insul it it ruins the insulating effect of the snow, which means that the soil stays frozen. So they, the government was conveniently misunderstanding. And I say this in what Marat An says is that this is one of the kindest governments in the world. So to understand that that's going on there, often in the name of environmental green energy. So people are talking about green colonialism, and I think it's a really important story to, to keep visible. Yeah, green colonialism is uh, not a term I've previously heard that I'm recalling, and uh, I'm writing it down because I'm going to keep an eye out for that. That does occur and uh, is important. I love one of the things that um, you do throughout the book is talk about a variety of animals and their effects on ecosystems and, and some in ways that may be even a bit surprising. So you talk about donkeys and um, of course talk about reindeer and uh, you got a little, uh, a little piece there for the beavers and how important they are for hydrology in landscapes. And so I want to encourage our audience, if you like animals uh, to check the book out for that reason too, because it, presents a lot of different ways in which the the animals, the larger animals or megafauna uh, impact landscape and water and climate. And um, just a lot of fun to uh, experience. You, you've woven so much together in this book, Judy. Oh, thank you. And I made some notes. Um, you also in there talk about a handful of organizations that are all doing really good work. Um, and this includes uh, Ecosystem Restoration Camp, Global Eco Village Network, Regeneration International, Theory U, uh, Transition Towns, Savory Institute. Um, it was a lot of fun to see some familiar names and then some that I wasn't familiar with. And uh, there are a few I'll be digging into more deeply to better understand their work. And who knows, maybe we'll even reach out to a couple of them and invite them to be on the podcast at some point. Uh, but I think it, it echoing the importance of 
our role as storytellers and uh, the importance of telling the stories of what's possible and what's working and amplifying those stories, Judy, uh, seems to be one of the keys in these times. And I love how at the end of the book, you, you conclude by saying, let's get inspired. And uh, that's how I feel after reading your book. Um, and I've already been talking about it with several friends and colleagues. So I just want to thank you for writing this and sharing this with the world. And uh, before we sign off uh, for today's uh, episode, is there is there anything else you'd like to share about the book, about your work, and or just in general uh, to our audience in the Why on Earth community? Yeah, I guess it's it's something that I uh, noted in the very beginning of the book that earth repair is a participatory sport. That sometimes we're trained to defer to the experts, you know, like you know, like big problems require the experts. Well as we've been seeing, that doesn't always play out so well. You know, people in power and people with, um, you know, supposed expertise are fallible just like all of us. But there is much that we can do and we have much more agency than, than we imagine that we do. And that that starts right where you are, you know, right on the land, the soil, you know, we can create biodiversity and, you know, enhance the cycling of water wherever we are. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And, and I just, I want to mention just, I know we're wrapping up, but there's one thing that popped in that I want to be sure we include in our discussion. And that is in some of these very arid and brittle landscapes, that gestures that people have done in making swales and planting certain plants and building soil have triggered these positive feedback loops that literally enhance precipitation and create this outward growing greening in desert landscapes. And uh, it's, it's such a powerful image and possibility of, uh, uh, or, or example or symbol of what's possible in landscapes all over. So I just wanted to be sure to mention that, Judy. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to say on that particular thread, because it, it was so potent reading about that. Yeah, no, just, j I guess the only thing is that, um, as one permaculture teacher, Andrew Millison says, is that the fact that some of the most successful projects are in some of the most difficult and extreme environments shows us just what is possible, that that can give us hope because if it can be done in those places, well then, you know, a lot of, then it's much easier in so many other environments. Absolutely. Well, Judy, thanks so much. It's a pleasure as always to visit with you today. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you. You too. Take care. Okay. Take care now. Bye-bye. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WhyOnEarth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.